Hi there, last week I was talking with someone, and as you might probably imagine, one thing led to another, and soon enough we found ourselves talking about none other than Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies, blockchain, and everything that could be grouped into this category. Now, this person had no prior knowledge about any of these topics, she was aware to one extent about Bitcoin and how, I wouldn't even say that she knew how it works, but she had definitely heard of it from the mainstream media, however, that was for the most part parts about it, and for the first time in a very long time, actually I would argue that for the first time ever since I got into crypto, I had to explain everything in a very simple way. Of course I couldn't go into any detail and I couldn't use any complicated jargon. Now by the way, not that I would be particularly able to do so, but definitely I had to very much simplify and boil down to the very basics of uh, how the entire crypto space works. Also because crypto, if you think about it, is one of the hardest topics to learn really, and seeing how I was, at least to a certain extent, successful in simplifying all these topics, I thought about making this video, because I thought, if I can explain and do a fairly good job at explaining crypto from scratch, why not try to do the exact same thing for everyone, and most importantly try to summarize all the topics pertaining and, and related to Bitcoin that one may need when just getting into crypto. As a result, in this video, we're going to go through everything, and maybe not everything per se, but definitely the vast majority of things that I personally believe, so do not take this as, as the holy grail and the absolute truth, but rather by the time you get to the end of this video, you'll have hopefully achieved a good understanding of what crypto is about and how it works. While I will be talking, I will be drawing on this white bot, and as you can see by the way, I've already written several things, but unfortunately, when I recorded this video the last time, the footage went missing, and as a result I, I wasted an entire video, but that's not a problem because now I'm able to do the same thing again, and I will obviously do it much much better and more efficiently than I did the first time. Anyways, without any further ado, let's get into it. So, let's begin with the most important question, which is also, in my opinion, the first thing you've got to understand when entering crypto. What is blockchain, right? It is something we hear and we see thrown around everywhere, blockchain this, blockchain that, in the mainstream media, YouTube videos, uh, online social media, Twitter, actually now it's called X, but generally speaking it's a term we see thrown around everywhere. But what does it actually mean? And the best way to explain it is that uh, it is a digital ledger, okay? Take for, do you remember, for example, I mean, not to remember necessarily, are you aware how people in the past, back before modern technology started being widely adopted, used to keep track of things, for example, accountants, people dealing with money and keeping track of transactions. It used to be done on books, right? You would manually write on a notebook, in a, in a diary, things like that. That's what blockchain is essentially, but in digital form. With blockchain, we have, you can call it again, a database, which just displays transactions. For example, person A, let's call her Alice, sends person B, let's call him Bob, $100. That's digital, it is displayed on a screen in a computer, that's how it, it is recorded, there's no person writing it manually. Now, this is not something that only happens in cryptos. Banks work the same way when you send money to someone, whether that's just only your other bank account or someone you know or a business, whatever the transaction may be, it will be recorded digitally right? That's, that's pretty much how it works. However, the big difference between, let's say, Bitcoin and the bank account, your bank, no matter where you are from, and no matter what currency you use, is that a bank is centralized. And this is what's so different between traditional finance and cryptos, because while banks and financial institutions and just traditional finance in general is centralized, blockchain technology is decentralized. Now, this means what the name implies, at least the centralized part, which is that uh, it is central. There's a central part, a central authority overseeing and controlling everything. Take, for example, a bank. The bank will control your bank accounts and they will have the power to determine whether they want to offer you the services, whether they want to suspend your account. They can do that and it's entirely in their power because, again, they are controlling the service they're offering you, okay? They are the central part, the central authority authority of uh, that service. Now, the big difference is that uh, blockchain technology, and now let, let me just say this very quickly, blockchain does not solely mean Bitcoin, okay? Bitcoin is, let me give you a simple example. 
building houses. Now, just for disclosure, I know nothing about building houses, but that's just the thing that more or less everyone who may not be into that industry understands, which is that all houses are built with a foundation. You need a foundation in order to then build a house, build the walls, etc. Now, all cryptocurrencies have that foundation and that foundation is called blockchain, but then they will change. Some cryptocurrencies, let's keep using the metaphor, will have one floor, two floors. One floor will be bigger than the second one, whereas in other houses, the second floor will be bigger than the first one. Then maybe certain houses will have, I don't know, blue painted walls, whereas other houses will have the walls painted white. And there is a wide variety, right? Not all houses are the same, but broadly speaking, all houses have a very similar way of being built. That's essentially how blockchain can be best described. Bitcoin. Now, the thing about Bitcoin is that it was the first cryptocurrency. And what all cryptocurrencies have in common is blockchain technology. Now, the key thing about blockchain is that it is decentralized. Contrary to, for example, again, a bank which has their own headquarters and there are people controlling said bank which will have all the power to do as they wish, blockchain is decentralized. That means that there is no single authority and no single entity controlling it. And individual cryptocurrencies, whether that's Bitcoin, Ethereum, are built on a blockchain. Now, Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency to ever be invented. It was created in 2009 by someone who went by the name of Satoshi Nakamoto. To this day, nobody knows who that Satoshi Nakamoto is. We don't even know if it's just one single person, a group of people, we don't know to what nationality he or they belong to. And we've got no idea who this person or this group of individuals are. Now, what we do know, however, for certain is why, and let's assume that it was a single person, that just flows better in, in, in the speech. What we do know for certain is that he created Bitcoin because he was fed up with the central control that banks had and still have to this day over the population. Now, you might have heard, I mean, I'm sure you have heard of it, that in, in 2008 and 2009, the financial crisis happened. Now, it will all depend on where you are from. If you're from the US, even if you're on the younger side, the way I am, I was born in 2002, so of course, I couldn't have witnessed it firsthand, but definitely our parents and our grandparents have. And what ended up happening there is that, to put it very simply, banks and financial institutions over leveraged themselves. They were approving for mortgages people who didn't necessarily have the capabilities to pay them back. And once everything came crashing down, so did the economy. And that's what created and caused the great financial crisis. Now, Satoshi was fed up with what was happening and with seeing average and hardworking people losing their homes, losing their pensions for no necessary fault of their own, because at the end of the day, everyone wanted to get a house and it shouldn't be the average person's job to understand how finance and how the financial markets and all those very complicated things work. Now, we will not be diving into that now because that's beyond the scope of this video. But what's important to take away from this is that Bitcoin was created following that disaster. But at the same time, Satoshi didn't want to create just a bank 2.0, which would have had another centralized party, which would have ended up controlling everything the way it happens with traditional banking. He wanted something that no one would have control over. He wanted to create a form of payment. Actually, let's go very quickly and look at the white paper, which is simply the, the brief description that Satoshi gave, which is just a short document detailing how the project, which is Bitcoin, was going to work. And we only have to read the white paper, not even the whole white paper, but just the first couple of sentences from the first paragraph in order to understand how Satoshi really intended Bitcoin to work and why he created it. And if we zoom in, we can read the following. A purely peer-to-peer -peer version of electronic cash would allow online payments to be sent directly. Oh, I've highlighted what a mess have I made. Let's undo that. Would allow online, pay would allow online payments to be sent directly from one party to another without going through a financial institution. That's what's absolute key, guys. Without going through a financial institution. That's precisely what Bitcoin was about and why Satoshi created it. But at this point, you might also be wondering, wait a minute, if there is no central party, which is the case in banks, financial institutions, any company whatsoever, the government itself, how do we make sure that uh, the network, the blockchain, Bitcoin in this case, won't be manipulated, right? If there is no one controlling and overseeing what people do within the network, what would prevent you from sending yourself Bitcoin twice and simply doubling your money? 
How can that be prevented? How can we have a system that uh, is decentralized? How can we have a system if no one controls it? How can we prevent cheating, lying, and just and just for lack of a better term, screwing over one another. Now, I'm perfectly sure that 99% of the people, generally speaking, are perfectly fine and honest and ethical individuals, but it's not everyone, right? So we need a system in place that will guarantee that everyone, regardless if they're good or bad people, will be able to adhere and, and take part into the system without corrupting it. And for that, we need a system that will allow us to achieve consensus, to agree on the state of the network. For example, let's go to our previous example, Alice sends Bob one BTC. Now, if we overlook the fact that Alice must be in a first world country and that she has to be at least to an extent well off, otherwise she won't have $50,000 to buy Bitcoin with, but that's a whole other topic. When she does that, how do we achieve consensus? How can we make sure again that uh, Alice has not cheated? Alice has not double sent her Bitcoin balance and doubled the Bitcoin in existence. How do we prevent any sort of cheating? And how do we make sure that all the transactions get added to the network? Participants of the Bitcoin blockchain will have to agree. They will all be separate entities and they will all have to come into agreement that, uh, well, Alice did in fact send the Bitcoin to Bob. And that's precisely what Satoshi's vision was about. How can all the participants of the network achieve consensus? My handwriting, by the way, is horrible because I haven't handwritten in a very, very long time. I usually just type on the keyboard, so I have to get used to that. But either way, how can we achieve consensus? You see, a blockchain needs a way to verify the transactions where the participants, i.e. the people who use it, can come to form a consensus and an agreement on the state of the network. And by state, I mean that when Alice will have sent the Bitcoin to Bob, the ones validating the network will have to come into agreement. And that is done via something that's called a consensus mechanism. I know, the name is pretty self-explanatory. There are two main consensus mechanisms, proof of fork, which is also abbreviated in POW, and proof of stake, or POS. And yes, I know that in English POS also means something else, but that's not it. It's proof of stake, not, yeah, never mind. Anyways, on top of that, in addition to the whole question of how we prevent cheating, such as Alice doubling her Bitcoin from the example before, there's also the question of how do we prevent someone from entering the network and just taking ownership of it? How, how do we make sure that uh, an individual, a malicious actor for lack of a better term, doesn't just take over the network? And that's exactly, that's precisely where the genius of Satoshi Nakamoto comes into place. Because what he did is that he implemented something that is known as mining. And no, not mining as in going with a pickaxe into the mines and mining for, what do people mine for? Gold? Silver, I mean, silver, is silver mined? I have no idea, but definitely it's not that type of mining. I want to remind you guys that everything we're discussing here is 100% digital. Nothing about anything we're discussing is in any way, shape or form physical, as in you can touch it, you can write on it or anything like that. It's all on a computer. And with the said, Mining is the key thing that uh, makes up how Bitcoin works. Because you see, in order to solve everything we've discussed up until this point, you might understand already that there needs to be some sort of stake in the network. That would essentially be the only way to prevent a rogue actor from uh, cheating the system. If you have to prove that um, you have ownership in it, if you have to prove that you've done work, that you've participated into the network in order to gain the ability to take part in it, then that would change everything. And mining is the process that not only protects and guarantees that the network will remain stable, that the Bitcoin blockchain will remain stable, but it's also the process and the mechanism through which new Bitcoin gets created into existence, gets issued. Let's also write issuance. Okay, now, how does mining work? Let's take a step back because otherwise we can spiral very quickly into very complex topics. It's just going to create a mess. And believe me, guys, I've been through this myself. I had to watch and consume at one point all these pieces of content about how mining, how Bitcoin, how blockchain works. And believe me, it was unbelievably hard to understand and to navigate through everything. And the last thing I'd want here is for me to create further confusion into the heads of anyone who might just be starting with crypto. 
So, the simplest way to explain mining is that it is a yes work, or put it better, it is a process of guessing numbers. Yes, I'm aware that this does not make a lot of sense, and I can already picture the face you're making right now, but yes, you heard it correctly, it is a yes work. Let me put it this way. Imagine I was asking you to, to pick a number, to guess a number between 1 and 100. A random number, it can be any of them from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, all the way up to 100. And you have to guess the number. It is 100% random and it is all up to you in competition with the other miners, which is what people mine in Bitcoin and we're going to get into how mining works exactly very shortly. But the people who partake into mining are called miners. Let me write that too. So imagine I was giving you these two combinations and I was asking you to give me a random number. Let's say that the number was 70. Again, it doesn't mean anything. It's a random number, 100%. And let's also say that instead of just you, yes, you, the one who is watching this video from your own device, I want to pick 10 different people. 10 different people, again, all of you guys watching the video right now. Hopefully someone is going to watch this video, but it's an entirely different topic. 10 people and you'll have to guess this number, a number you do not know. It's a competition, right? This suddenly turns into a competition. And the first person, okay, the first person among you 10, the first person who is going to guess this number will win the block rewards. Now, block rewards, what's that? I haven't mentioned it yet in the video, I know, but a block, okay, and again, let me repeat myself in saying that it's 100% digital, it's not a random cube, no, it's a way of putting things into words and following the same principle that everything is digital, a block will also be just an entry in a database. And the Bitcoin block is simply the way in which Bitcoin transactions are grouped together. For example, the transaction where Ali sends Bob a certain, doesn't matter how much or how little amount of BTC, will be one of the transactions that will enter, that will be present within a block. Each Bitcoin block contains an average, so it's not a set on number, but it's more an average of 2,500 transactions. TX is the abbreviation in crypto for transaction. And now you might be wondering, okay, but what does it have to do with all the guesses, the numbers we've just discussed here? And they're all linked to guess because you see, the miner that will guess the right number will earn the privilege to validate, i.e. to make sure that all the transactions within a block are valid and that block will be broadcasted to all the other miners and it will be added to the long list of roughly 800,000 Bitcoin blocks that have been created since 2009. Now, however, you see, instead of just a very simple guesswork of a number between 1 and 100, imagine you had to guess a number between, where should I write it? Okay, let's write it here, between 1 and a billion, not million, but billion. That's a much, much harder number to guess, right? Compared to a number between 1 and 100, where the possible outcomes are 100. Here, however, we have 1 billion, which is a very large number. And the human mind can't possibly do that, right? As a result, we will need computers, we will need this, and not this literally, a MacBook won't do the job, but we need something smart, something that can do millions, if not billions and billions of processes and commands every single second. Let's move this here and paste this here. This is the official definition of mining by Investopedia, which is that mining is performed using hardware and software to generate a cryptographic number that matches criteria. This is of course a very complicated and not so beginner friendly way of explaining the whole concept, but I promise you that we'll get there. You see, in order to be able to guess such a wide and such a vast number, we will need computers. In the beginning, when Bitcoin wasn't anywhere as popular and as, as known as it is today, people didn't need any particularly fancy or advanced computers. As a matter of fact, have you ever heard of those stories that randomly from time to time pop up in the mainstream media 
where they talk about some unknown person, some average person that used to mine Bitcoin in the early days from their own laptop or from their own computer. And now they're suddenly incredibly wealthy and, and rich. Well, that was how it was occurring because in the beginning it was very easy to do it. And when I say easy, I am referring to something called mining difficulty. And I know I'm throwing at you so many words, terminology that you might have not heard up until this point, but I promise you that this is extremely important for you to understand. And well, mining difficulty, okay, let's word it a little bit differently. Bitcoin was built in an incredibly sophisticated and smart way, for lack of a better term, by Satoshi Nakamoto. What he did essentially is that he made sure that a Bitcoin block will always be mined every 10 minutes on average. What this means is that one Bitcoin block containing 25-ish hundred transactions inside of it, will be authenticated, will be verified by all the miners every 10 minutes. And in order for a miner, i.e. someone who partakes in the network, to verify a Bitcoin block, he, they, if they're a group, it doesn't have to be just one person, will have to guess a random number. Now, you might be wondering, but why a yes? What, what does it have to do with Bitcoin, with transactions? And this is where we come back to the thing we were discussing earlier, which is that there has to be a way that prevents malicious actors from just entering the network and doing whatever they want. If there is a stake, if a miner is directly invested into the network, it will be counterproductive, it will be against the incentives to ruin said the network. In the beginning, as we just said, and when I say beginning, I am referring to the early days, to the first three, four years of Bitcoin's creation. So between 2009, we can see it here on TradingView. Let's go a bit further back. Okay, TradingView's history only goes back to 2011, but it doesn't matter. So in the early days, when nobody knew about Bitcoin, that's the easiest way to put it, the mining difficulty was extremely low. We can see it here. And of course, as the price started going up, and as the price started increasing and as people started learning about Bitcoin, in fact, I think, and I'm saying I think because back then I was 12 years old, so I couldn't remember it from a first-hand experience, but Bitcoin, to my knowledge, first started appearing on the radar of the mainstream media around 2014, when the first real and actual bull run, which is a period in a market, it's not just about crypto, but any market, stock market, precious metals, anything really. When an asset is in a bull market, it means that it has a period of upside growth. And it was only around here, late 2013 and 2014, when Bitcoin started appearing in the news, when average people people like you and me started becoming aware of it because up until that point only really, really smart people, people who are into cryptography and all those extremely complicated fields, which truth be said, I'm nowhere as smart as I need to be in order to get into that. So I'm not even going to talk about it. But all I'm trying to say is that in the very beginning, the mining difficulty, which put into very simple terms, is the range of numbers that has to be guessed, the range of numbers such as 1 to 100, within which the right combination and the right number will be, was very small, was very little. A normal computer or laptop back in the day could realistically and easily guess that number. Now, to make things simpler, imagine that back in the day, your computer had to guess a number between 1 and a million. A very easy and a very simple combination. For reference, a modern computer computer nowadays can do billions upon billions of processes per second. That's how large the numbers we're talking about are. But what we're discussing here is not with the goal of being realistic, it's just with the goal of explaining things in an understandable and without the usage of, again, fancy jargon, things that no one understands unless they're in the industry. So imagine that back in the day, 09, 2010, 2011, your normal laptop, the one you had in the house, just like everyone else, could do between one and a million guesses per second. And that was enough, that was perfect enough to guess the right combination. If you're going to want to dive deeper into it, this is called hashing, but that's already entering complex terminology, which is not something we're going to touch upon in this video. But if by any chance you're curious about it, this is 
what this process is called, which is just the guessing of the right combination. And as a result, the first minor, which again can be you, yes, you, does, you don't have to be someone specific, you don't even have to be particularly advanced in your technological skills. Now, sure, you've got to be more advanced than this and what we're making here, what and what we're explaining here, but you don't need to be a programmer. And the first miner who will get the right combination between one and a million will earn the rights and the privilege to validate, i.e. to make sure, and again, all of these things, all of these processes are 100% digital. They're not physical on a piece of paper. None of this is in any way, shape or form physical. And the miner who generates, to put it into Investopedia's words, the correct cryptographic number will get to validate and to make sure that all the 2,500 transactions, such as the one between Alice and Bob, that have been made on the Bitcoin blockchain are valid, are authentic, no one's cheating, no one's attempting to cheat. And once that is done, the miner will win and will be rewarded by the network for having partaken into the security and the stability of the blockchain network with something called the block rewards, the block rewards. And the miner, which could have been you 10 years ago, who would have guessed the right combination of numbers, which again, in the example of 12 years ago, would have been a random number between one and a million, would have been rewarded by the network with the block rewards to incentivize people to participate. Because again, everything works around the decentralization. And as a result, people have to be incentivized to behave ethically. Because if you have no one overseeing what you're doing, just checking and making sure that everyone's doing their parts, how are we going to make sure that uh, no one's cheating? That's everything we've been discussing in this video again. And that's how it's done via incentive. If you guess the right combination, again, of course, not you directly, you guessing the number, but if you partake via your equipment, a computer, in guessing the right combination that will be generated automatically by the network and no one will know up until the miner will have generated, you will be rewarded the block rewards. Now, Let's take a step back. This random combination and number between one and a million would have been the case, again, let's say in the beginning, in 10, 2010, 14 years ago. Now, however, computers are much faster, much more powerful, right? Technology has been evolving drastically since 09, 010. And the best computer and graphic card that you could have purchased 14 years ago is by all means obsolete nowadays. So does this actually mean that uh, you'll be able to generate a Bitcoin block every few seconds, every minute or so? Well, not exactly. While you'd be technically right in thinking that, this is where Satoshi's genius once again comes into place because he designed something called mining difficulty. Because you see, if a computer with the capabilities that they had 14 years ago could guess the right combination in 10 minutes on average, we said it earlier, a Bitcoin block gets mined every 10 minutes, well, wouldn't that mean that nowadays a Bitcoin block would be mined in maybe 30 seconds? Now, I'm not sure exactly how much bets the computers have gotten, but it's a lot, right? There is no comparison between now and 15 years ago. So what changes? What does mining difficulty mean? And well, what it means, and now I'm sure you'll be surprised to just witness how ingenious this was and how much of a forward thinking vision this individual had. He designed, he made sure that uh, every so often the Bitcoin blockchain mining difficulty, i.e. let's put it in simpler words, the range of the numbers that will have to be guessed by the miners will be readjusted. Okay, let's make things a little bit simpler. Let's say that today, to mine a Bitcoin block, the miners will have to guess a number between one and a million. That's what allows today's computational power to achieve every 10 minutes, which means that all the computers that are being used for mining by everyone, you, me, we could mine Bitcoin as well if we wanted. We don't need to be programmers. We don't need to be cryptographers. And all the computers 
combined can generate the right combination. So let's say that this following block will have as the right combination, I don't know, let's say 585,346. This will be the number that all the computers will have to work and will have to dedicate their processing power towards guessing. The first computer and the first miner who will guess this right combination will get the privilege to mine the Bitcoin block and he will be awarded the block rewards. Now, let's say that next week, and let's also move this a little bit to the side, let's say that next week, a new technology will come out, a new computer, maybe a new graphics card, doesn't really matter, but something new, something better. And now it will take maybe five minutes. Let's say that the output has doubled, which never really happened. But again, we're making examples. We're not playing with the actual numbers. Otherwise, it would become really overwhelming to be dealing with the right numbers and the right some cent and the right amounts here. So we're keeping things simple. And let's say that now thanks to this new technology, again, a graphics cards, a laptop, doesn't really matter. It's just for the sake of the example. Now it takes five minutes to mine a Bitcoin block, i.e. five minutes to guess the combination of a number between one and a million. Well, what happens now? The Bitcoin network is built upon processing a block every 10 minutes on average, not five. And to solve that issue, something called the mining difficulty comes into place, which is something that occurs every roughly two weeks on average. And every 2016 blocks, the network will calculate and check how long it's taken to mine all those blocks. And if it's taken longer than two weeks, that'll mean that the difficulty is too high. The difficulty will be lowered, which means that the number that will have to be guessed will be between a smaller range. And on the opposite, if it's taken less than two weeks to mine the 2016 blocks, that'll mean that the difficulty is too easy, which means that it will be increased, i.e. the range of the number that will have to be guessed will be larger. The range between the two numbers may not be, let's say, between one and a million, but between one and 1.5 million, which will, of course, make the guesswork by the computers controlled by the miners more difficult because now they'll have to guess a number that sits within a much larger pool of possibilities. But that's not everything about mining because, you see, while in the beginning people could mine from their computers, from their laptops, simply because the mining difficulty was low and uh, the guess, the, the number that had to be guessed was within the computational capabilities of a normal personal computer. But now things have gotten much more difficult. Now you couldn't mine Bitcoin from a normal laptop, a normal computer, even if you have a fancy computer with a modern GPU, etc. You still couldn't mine Bitcoin. And that's because the mining difficulty has gone exponentially higher. The only way that nowadays you can mine Bitcoin is through this. Have you ever seen something like this? Maybe you have, but perhaps not in a normal environment. In fact, I'd be willing to guess that you might have seen something like this graphics card in a picture like this. Have you? Have you not? Maybe in the mainstream media, online, articles, blogs, YouTube videos. Have you ever seen one of those enormous colossal storage spaces, warehouses full of graphics cards doing nothing besides mining Bitcoin? Well, maybe you have, maybe you haven't. I'd be willing to bet that you have. Maybe you didn't even know what you were looking at, but you more than likely did. And this is how Bitcoin nowadays is mined. It's not done through a personal computer, through a normal GPU, but rather through these very specific graphics cards. They are so specific that they're not even called graphics cards, but rather application-specific integrated circuits, or more commonly referred to online as ASIC, application-specific integrated circuit, which is after all the abbreviation of the longer name. And nowadays, if you pay attention online, you will come across so many stories about ASIC miners, because this is the only method in which Bitcoin gets mined. And these ASIC miners are built specifically and solely with the purpose of mining Bitcoin. You can't do anything else besides that. That's the only purpose and their only goal for existing. And this is also, after all, why we couldn't mine Bitcoin on a normal graphics card. 
because while to my knowledge you could technically do that these ASIC miners are just exponentially more efficient and considering the electricity cost that you'd be incurring if you were to mine with let's say your laptop or your RTX graphics cards Bitcoin, you just be incurring a loss because of the electricity. And that's also what's caused over the years lots and lots of debates around Bitcoin's electricity consumption. Because as you can see here, there are warehouses upon warehouses built solely to mine Bitcoin through the use of ASIC miners. Even here, just look at how many there are. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 11, 12, 13, 14, you get the idea, right? 15, 16, 17, and other, I'd say 20 in this whole column as well. And it goes on and on and on. And the reason why it is such a huge topic of debate is that all these ASIC miners do nothing besides mining. They serve no other purpose. That's the thing. Now, I'm not going to debate over whether Bitcoin's electricity consumption is justified or not. That's not the point I'm trying to make here. I'm just telling you why people are so reluctant to be using Bitcoin in certain cases and why there is such a push against it. And let's be honest, Bitcoin does use a lot of electricity. Then the question is, does it justify the fact that Bitcoin is more or less, or actually, yes, pretty much entirely, the only currency on the face of the planet that is not controlled by a central entity, that it's not controlled by a central authority? Well, that will be up to you to decide. I'm not here to tell you what to believe. I'm just telling you what the different arguments are. And you have to analyze whether that's something that you value and whether that's something that can, in your mind, justify the huge electricity consumption, which in terms of bull run, it did end up consuming more electricity than certain countries. And that's a lot. This is one of the many graphs I was able to find and it perfectly displays the quantity and just now I know nothing about electricity, so I'm not going to explain to you what this symbol TWH means. In terms of what the acronym itself means, it simply means terawatt per hour, but that's not something I have experience with and that I could be discussing. However, it is not a secret that Bitcoin consumes a lot, and I truly mean a lot. But that is, without going into the topic, essential to the decentralization of the network, because the more users and more miners partake in securing the network, well, the safer and the more secure the network will be. That's the bare explanation of how this whole thing works and why if Bitcoin were to stop consuming as much electricity and if all the miners would stop mining Bitcoin, the network, the Bitcoin blockchain would lose the very same thing that makes it special. Otherwise, it would just become a centralized server controlled by very few individuals that would end up having all the power over Bitcoin. And that's, as we've talked about throughout the entirety of the video, precisely what Satoshi wanted to avoid. This is, of course, a much more in-depth discussion than what we're doing here, but broadly speaking, that is more or less it. However, we are not done yet because we still have to go over the block rewards. It is something we've already briefly mentioned earlier, and that is how miners get rewarded. Because if you remember from here, a block gets mined every 10 minutes, and the miner who has guessed the right number, which is again a random number that has to be guessed, and the first miner who guesses it will get to write the next block. And when that happens, the miner will be rewarded the block rewards. And also just for reference, the numbers we've gone over for the sake of simplicity, well, let's say a random number between one and a million. That was the example we gave earlier, right? But you've got to understand that the real numbers, the ones that have to be guessed by trial and error, or in other words, by brute force by the ASIC miners, will be so large and so preposterous that I doubt that our human minds would be even remotely capable of uh, conceiving and of understanding and uh, comprehending how larger numbers those are. That's how crazy it is. To simply give you the idea of just how insane, and calling it insane is a huge understatement, the amount of yeses that all the ASIC miners that are mining Bitcoin, yes, 
every single second, we have something called the Bitcoin hash rate. And as you can see here, okay, I know this may look confusing at first glance, but that's what you have to take from it. The hash is just the number of guesses that are made per second. And the Bitcoin hash rate is just what we use and what everyone, especially those working in the industry, used to calculate either the entire network's performance, or let's say you were to buy your own ASIC miner and you'd want to know the hash rate i.e. how efficient that ASIC miner will be and how much it will contribute to the network in terms of guesses, which would at the same time translate into how much you could be earning with that ASIC miner. But it's not everything that can be calculated because here we can see that the current Bitcoin hash rate is 557. How do you even pronounce this? Exahash hash, something like that. And it essentially means that all the ASIC miners, so all the computational power that is directly and consistently working to guess the right number, which is called hash, amounts to this <laughs> number. I'm not even sure how to pronounce it or even what it means, what it represents. It's such a large number that it eludes the understanding of any rational human being. This is in fact one quintillion and one quintillion is equivalent to 1000 quadrillion, so 1000 here, or one million trillions, or finally, let's add three more zeros, one billion billions. So, the Bitcoin blockchain, all the ASIC miners combined together can process and can guess, where is it? 557 exahash per second. That's an unbelievable number and it is perfectly normal that we will never understand what this means. And in case you have any doubts to what this actually really means, Imagine just going one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, etc. And thinking, how many can you do per second? Maybe five, like one, two, three, four, five. That's uh, per second, right? That's how many guesses you can realistically do. Maybe a bit more if you do it in your mind rather than counting out loud. But that's just broadly speaking, how many you can do, right? And these are even simple numbers, one, two, three, four, five, etc. Imagine if you had to guess a million, one million, three hundred thousand, six hundred and sixty-eight. Random number completely off the top of my head right now. How many could you be thinking of per second. Well, the answer here is that all the ASIC miners in existence can calculate 557 billion billion trials per second. By this point, I'm sure you must be <laughs> completely overwhelmed. However, we are almost at the end of the video because all we have now left to go over are the block rewards. Okay guys, I am back. I had taken a little break between the two recording sessions, but now I'm here. And as we were saying earlier, earlier for you and a few days ago for me, we had left everything at the block rewards. So the block reward is the reward, as the name obviously implies, that miners will receive as compensation for mining a block, for mining the next block, which is simply, as we've discussed throughout this entire video, the process of guessing the right number, which will prove to the network that they've contributed with the resources, which simply means with their computing power to the security of the network. Now the block reward is a set of and it is also the only way that new bitcoins get created into existence, get issued into existence. That's the only inflation mechanism, if you wish to call it that way, that exists within the bitcoin blockchain, that will get issued only once per block, obviously to the miner that will have mindset block. The current block reward, and it is very important to know that it is current, that it is just now, it will change as we'll get into shortly, is 6.25 BTC. Also, it is so difficult to type numbers and letters with the pen on the iPad. I've never done it before, but it is so hard. It is much more difficult than handwriting with a normal pen on a piece of paper. But anyways, that's irrelevant. So this is the current reward. And as we know that the block gets mined roughly every 10 minutes, we will know that Bitcoin on average will generate 6.25 BTC every 10 minutes. Now, however, these rewards won't always be 6.25 because you see, there's also something 
something else about the Bitcoin blockchain, and that is the Bitcoin halving. And this is one of the most important, if not to be honest, the most important event concerning Bitcoin. The Bitcoin halving is the event where the block reward gets cut in half. It occurs every four years on average, or to be more precise, every 210,000 blocks mined. And as we now know and understand that the Bitcoin block gets mined every roughly 10 minutes, we can deduce and derive from that that 210,000 blocks will be mined every four years roughly. And it is of utmost importance to understand. You see, in the beginning, as we can also read from this picture, the Bitcoin block reward used to be 50 Bitcoins, and that was at a time when you could mine Bitcoin from your own laptop as we discussed earlier. Now, of course, back then, Bitcoin was worth barely anything at the time, and 50 Bitcoins were pretty much worthless. And that's one of the reasons why, as we discussed earlier in the video, many people in the past found themselves quite wealthy to say the least. And that was because, first of all, they were able to mine Bitcoin from their own computer, and they were also getting 50 Bitcoins as a reward. And being that those Bitcoins were basically worthless, they just accumulated them. And soon enough, once Bitcoin started taking off from 2014 onwards, they found themselves filthy rich to say the least. Now, of course, due to the nature of Bitcoin, the initial 50 Bitcoins per block didn't last long. In fact, in late 2012, the first having took place, which, for lack of a better term, cut in half the Bitcoin block rewards, from 50 Bitcoins to 25 Bitcoins. And that was also, if you think about it, when the first 210,000 blocks were mined. Which, let me tell you very quickly, it was on the 20th of November 2012 at 3.24pm UTC time. That's how precise it is, when the 200 and 10,000th block was mined, the algorithm and the whole Bitcoin blockchain network just updated itself. The second halving took place four years later, on the 9th of July 2016, and it dropped the block reward from 25 BTC, which was as well decreased from the 50 Bitcoin block reward that was in place in the beginning, but halved on the 28th of November 2012, and in July 2016, the block reward got half to 12.5 BTC. And finally, the most recent halving at the time of recording this video was obviously another four years later, which happened on the 11th of May 2020, which took the block reward from 12.5 to 6.25 BTC. And this amount has been the block reward for the past almost four years. Because in fact, as we can notice here, the next block reward is due to happen what day is today, the 22nd of February, so we are more or less two months away from the next block reward. Now, April 19th is of course an estimation, because we can't know for certain when we will reach the needed block height. And that's by the way what it's called, block height, which in this case it will obviously be 210,000 times 4, because this next halving is going to be the fourth halving. And as a matter of fact, we're approaching very quickly to the needed block heights of 840,000. And when this next halving will happen, the block rewards will once again be halved. And this next time around, the block rewards will become 3.125 BTC. Okay, so before we conclude the video, I would also like to talk about and discuss something quite interesting. Actually, I'd argue that in my personal opinion, this is the most interesting thing we've discussed throughout this entire video. And that is that, uh, well, if you remember, at the beginning of the video, we talked about how Satoshi Nakamoto, the pseudonymous inventor of Bitcoin, had created Bitcoin as a result of what happened in the 2008 financial crisis. Now, as we said also at the beginning of the video, that is not the topic of this video. We are not going to get into what caused it and what happened during that time. Also because that is, frankly speaking, way beyond my level of understanding of what took place. However, what I do know and what is very important for the history of Bitcoin, especially if you want to truly understand why this individual wanted to create Bitcoin and did so, and that is that, uh, well, in the very first block, as we've just discussed right before this, we are getting to 840,000 Bitcoin blocks. So that was the very first block that was mined on the Bitcoin network, which is so important that it is called Genesis block. And it is so fascinating because on top of being the very first and also that it was mined by Satoshi himself on the 3rd of January 2009, well, there is something quite special about this block. Because you see, as absurd as it may sound, Satoshi imprinted a message into that block. 
Now, I'm not sure on a technical level how he was able to do that because of course I'm not a programmer and that area of Bitcoin is way beyond my personal expertise. However, what he did, and that's so fascinating, and I think you can see my excitement as I'm speaking, the message encrypted within the first Bitcoin block, also known as the Genesis block, was the title of this article. If we zoom in, we can read it very clearly. Chancellor on the brick of second bailout for banks. And if we go to the top of the article and zoom a little bit on the page, we will see that the date when this article was posted was, coincidentally enough, Saturday the 3rd of January 2009, which was also exactly the day when the first Bitcoin block was mined. And, well, what more can I say than this? I personally think that Satoshi couldn't have made his reasoning and motives behind creating Bitcoin any clearer than this really. How much clearer could it get than linking in the very first block the headline of a newspaper highlighting the disaster that had just occurred? And with this said, I say that this is everything for this video. This is by far the longest video I've ever made to date. I really hope that if you got this far into the video, you have enjoyed it and have learned something new from it. Thank you so much for watching and see you in the next one.